All right, since Annie is still over there by the last remaining umbrella, we're going to do one more little contest. Uh, how many people, if, stand up if you've been in marketing research, kind of touching this industry for less than a year. Less than a year? Less than two years. Wow, these are all senior people. We'll give it away to a different group. <laughs> um, our final speaker this uh, track is Joe Sauer with Sinian Decision Sciences. He's the SVP of Research Operations. And um, the point of this is really around the balance between emotion and reason. And I'm very excited to hear the perspective and the talk. So welcome, Joe. Well, for those of you that have uh, the agenda with you, I feel like I'm starting with two strikes against me. I'm not Aaron Reed. Um, I'm his understudy today, I suppose. Uh, I'm also the last speaker in between you and a break. And so I'll try to keep this as, as quick moving and as engaging as possible. Hopefully some of you were able to attend the track yesterday on implicit research or non-conscious research techniques. It's certainly uh, a family of techniques that's moving into the mainstream uh, of the research community. I think one of the consistent themes yesterday was the, the need to ensure as a, as a uh, profession, as a discipline, that we continue to uh, develop strong, robust methods and validate those methods wherever possible. And so what I'd like to show you today, or share with you today, is a process of validation that we followed, uh, illustrating the power of an integrated decision-making model that combines both system one and system two cues um, uh, into a single, uh, single model. And uh, unlike uh, uh, historically, where we've over-relied on explicit techniques, the danger in really maturing out these implicit techniques or non-conscious measurement techniques is that we swing the pendulum too far and over-rely on those techniques. And really, when you think about decision-making, even the most rapid, impulsive decisions uh, are governed by both system one and system two thinking. And so we need to develop decision-making models that are reflective of uh, the best possible data that we can capture on those two modes of thinking. So, uh, the quote of the day yesterday comes from, uh, in my mind at least, comes from the, uh, the irrepressibly upbeat uh, John Kieran from Brain Juicer. Uh, he said, uh, in one of his poems, he said, uh, we do not think as much as we think we think. And so I'll offer a humble corollary to that, which is, uh, we feel more than we feel we feel. Uh, and this is really what's been pushing uh, the research profession uh, to really grow these techniques to try to capture emotion. We had the great fortune of uh, working with a, a client based in the U.S. Uh, named Macy's. They are the largest fashion retailer in the United States. Uh, they had a, a house brand, uh, about $600 million brand, that uh, had been declining in sales for about three years, and they really weren't sure what to do with it. They knew that they needed to commit to a full redesign of the brand. And so they did that. They actually launched, uh, uh, were planning to launch a spring line and a fall line uh, within this, uh, this overall master brand. And uh, the conventional wisdom when you're buying, when you're a buyer, a fashion buyer uh, in that industry, is that experience will tell you how much of a particular product you need to buy to stock the shelves. And so Macy's wanted to put that to the test and, and hired us. Uh, to work with them to try to understand whether research could actually provide more predictive accuracy uh, uh, to sales than the buyer's intuition and experience. And so uh, we readily accepted. We designed a project that involved uh, both explicit measurement techniques. Uh, in this particular case, we designed a choice-based conjoint exercise, uh, which gives us the wonderful opportunity, as, as you all know, of, of uh, modifying some of the constructs of the overall offer and starting to understand, at least consciously, explicitly, deliberatively, uh, what preferences uh, begin to dominate uh, in the overall decision making. We also designed a, what we call a sentient prime experiment, which is an implicit association technique, um, where we are actually capturing and quantifying the emotion involved in, in this decision as 
well. And if you think about fashion, particularly high fashion, uh, these uh, purchases are as much a manifestation of yourself and give you uh, a sense of relation to self. Uh, so there's this belief that um, the emotional side of things is at least as important as the, um, uh, the, the rational, deliberative side of things. And so uh, we, uh, we undertook this project, uh, delivered results in April. The May line had already been bought. And so we asked them as part of the project if they would share the buy data with us in addition to the sales data that came uh, out of the, the spring line. And they, they agreed, and it was a, a wonderful opportunity to provide the kind of validation that we, we um, emphasize as being so important for us. The first thing we did was look at the accuracy of the buyer, the buy data, uh, the buyers for this line. And what we found was that um, uh, the R squared between, or the correlation, if you will, between the buy and actual sales data was only about 28%. Uh, the R value is about 50 some percent or 0.5. The, uh, the correlation is only 28%. That's pretty low when you think about it. That means that you're buying a whole lot of merchandise that's ending up discounted on a clearance rack at some point. And so we knew that research had to provide better results. Uh, so we looked at uh, the results of the, the conjoint exercise, the, the choice-based conjoint exercise. That actually had a correlation of 69% to the buy. So the, the, the explicit preferences uh, as expressed through that exercise were actually providing us with, with a fairly significant improvement over what the buyer's experience and intuition suggested that they buy. And so we could stop there. We've improved, we've invested in research and we've delivered a considerable improvement to the predictive accuracy. What happens though if we actually build this integrated model that combines not only the explicit results but also uh, the results of the implicit association work? Uh, you can see that incredibly, uh, perhaps, the uh, correlation to actual sales goes up to 94%. So we're accounting for a tremendous proportion, the majority, vast majority of the sales data by developing an integrated model that combines system one and system mm. two data. Now, I can hear you say, um, so you lucked out. It was a fluke. Um, the, the critical thing here is we repeated it again and again and again with different lines and different brands and form bases. Fashion study number two, you can see that we actually delivered an R value of 0.93. Uh, number three, we delivered an R value of 9.2. And just in case you think all of our studies deliver uh, correlations over 90, uh, we actually did a fourth time before a fourth line and came up with an R value of 0.89. So there's something really going on here that uh, is really fundamental, is really crucial. We have gut level decision making that actually is has a very low correlation to actual results in the marketplace, uh, as measured in this case by sales data. We add in explicit measurement techniques and we get a significant improvement in predictive validity, predictive accuracy. We then layer in uh, implicit work and actually develop an integrated uh, model of decision making that provides extremely accurate forecasts. And after all, researchers really, at the end of the day, are in the prediction game. Uh, and so we're making predictions that have a considerably higher degree of accuracy than any other single technique uh, or capability has in the past. So I now hear the, the next objection, which is, right, fashion. Very engaging topic. Uh, it's an expression of self, an extension of self. Um, uh, and so emotion plays a huge role in that. What about some of those other decisions that we make, the other 999 decisions we make in a day? Um, how about those? Well, you can't get much blander than oatmeal or porridge, uh, with the, as they say in Europe. And so we actually had an opportunity to do this, a similar type of study uh, with Walmart. And they were looking uh, to do some research to understand how they should allocate shelf space to different brands uh, of porridge, and specifically looking at um, the interaction between price and pack size. And so they were trying to optimize that relationship in the context of a store shelf. Once again, we did research in the fall, uh, the, the uh, hot time of year, pun partially intended, for oatmeal is in the, the winter time, so January, February, March in, uh, in North America. And uh, in this particular study, we didn't have access to the buy data, but we certainly had access to the sales data. 
And so we went through a similar process where we look at um, the explicit results only. So the, in this particular case, it was a max diff exercise rather than a, a conjuring exercise. Um, but the, the system two, if you will, um, research technique, uh, this rational, deliberative, purposeful uh, technique, delivered a, a fairly low correlation at a 0.41. Um, in this case, we're, we're actually going to separate out the, the different models. So instead of looking at just the explicit and then an integrated model, we're actually going to look at the explicit and then the implicit and then an integrated model. In this particular case, uh, we actually drove the correlation with the using the implicit results, the results of the implicit association test, up to 0.51. Not bad. Uh, better than the explicit results alone, better than max diff results alone, uh, but still not where we'd like to be. We'd like to be up higher than that if, uh, if possible. So when we develop this integrated model that includes both uh, explicit data and implicit data, we're back up into a, a more comfortable range in terms of confidence in our predictive uh, accuracy of a core <laughs> Now it's important to understand with both of these case studies, these are a priori predictions that we're making. These aren't like media mix modeling or some other technique, modeling techniques, where you get data and then retrofit a model that answers that data, that speaks to that data. These are predictions that we're doing, taking research data before something happens, and then measuring the predictive accuracy of those, uh, those estimates, those forecasts that we make. And so because this is a priori, um, it's actually quite rare to see correlations in this 0.8 to 0.9 range. Typically, only get correlations that high when you're doing post hoc modeling rather than uh, a priori modeling. Um, and so there's, there's something that we've captured here in developing a model of decision making that integrates implicit and explicit results, rational and emotional uh, data together. Um, we also wanted to understand within the family of research techniques um, what uh, additional value are we getting from different techniques that we use. And so uh, one of the uh, uh, techniques that we tested was uh, emotional slider scales. So rather than the traditionally worded question uh, around stated intention or uh, stated attitudes, um, we actually provided slider scales. Uh, and we wanted to, to correlate that to see how closely correlated that was to derived preference. And derived meaning that we're getting that from uh, the conjoint exercises. And you can see that there's a very high degree of correlation between these two. Now, normally we want a high degree of correlation. In this case, we don't. We want a low degree of correlation because if we have a high degree of correlation, it means these two techniques are capturing the same phenomenon, essentially. So if you think about a correlation of 0.89, uh, the conscious preference derived from the conjoint exercise and the emotional um, rating scales derived from these sliders, so explicit sliders, are actually only about 11% unique. They're, they're overlapping to such a great degree. We also uh, heard yesterday about fast explicit, which is very similar in nature to true implicit, uh, but without the use of the visual priming before the sorting exercises. And so these fast explicit judgments um, can often be uh, very useful. They generate wonderful data, uh, but the question for us is, do they generate different data? Do they capture a different element of the decision-making phenomenon than the conjoint exercise? And in this case, you see a high correlation of 0.85. And so you see that these two, um, techniques are actually only about 15% unique. And so, again, we could use one or the other, and we're actually capturing, largely speaking, the same part of the decision-making process. Now we come to the punchline, I suppose, which is when we try to correlate uh, our sentient prime implicit emotional associations through the, the, the priming technique that we use with the explicit or reason-based uh, decision-making. You see that there's a very low correlation. There's only about a point three. That means that we are truly capturing something very different. We're capturing meaningful variance um, uh, uh, using these two techniques. And so you, you can see that um, in this case, we're actually capturing something that's about 66% unique. So yes, as we know from the theory and from the practice, system two judgments affect uh, or, or set up system one decisions and vice versa. There's definitely an overlap between the two. But the overlap is not so consequential that we can ignore one or the other and assume that 
system one thinking and judgments are reflected in system two decisions and vice versa. And so um, given that we're capturing uh, such a meaningfully or such different uh, parts of the decision process, the question then becomes, is it meaningful variance or is it just noise? And as you can see from our, our hot cereal sales, our porridge sales, um, that we actually are capturing a meaningful difference, differences that are uh, contributing meaningfully, significantly to the predictive accuracy of our forecasts. Uh, and as a result of that, um, we uh, now advocate quite strongly that we incorporate uh, both reason-based uh, measurement, emotion-based measurement into a single integrated decision-making model. Um, I think I'll leave it there. Um, uh, we do have some more uh, case study material. There's one on uh, Super Bowl advertising, uh, but if you're interested in seeing the results of this one and uh, talking you through it, uh, just swing by our, our, uh, our booth in the, the Grand Hall and we'll, we'll be happy to talk you through it. So when we look at most of the conversation in marketing and research over the course of the past few years, um, emotion has been the, the headline in almost every presentation. And it's been at odds with those of us that have been around for, you know, when we didn't do anything with emotion, didn't care. Uh, with, what's your rating on this attribute? Um, so the key takeaway here if I look, try to infer from everything, is there kind of equal? They're, they're, I don't know that they're equal. What we're finding is that when we run these types of, of validation studies that uh, models, predictive models that are based on uh, non-conscious measurement do tend to outperform more traditional uh, uh, models that are based on, on, uh, on reason alone, on the very deliberative conscious choice. Uh, but they're not enough on their own. They need to be combined. We make decisions by accessing both system one and system two processing. So our decision models need to reflect that modality. And until they do, uh, neither, neither technique on its own is really optimal. Uh, and so it's really, we don't think as much about which is better than the other as much as the integrated model of decision making is the right way to go. Questions from the audience? We have a question in the middle in the back. Um, yeah, um, I'm kind of interested in what you're saying because I suppose coming from the standpoint of uh, being a traditional market research area, market research agency that moved into implicit testing, um, I don't find what you're saying at all surprising because yes, of course, once you add implicit on top of explicit, you get great predictive power. Um, I guess really my question for you is, um, and it, it, it seems quite ironic, given that you know your specialism is very much in the implicit uh, research area. Are you really saying there isn't an implicit and explicit research? There's just research. I think that's uh, that, that's an accurate description. Um, it, it's akin to there being only one brain, and a brain that has to make a discrete decision. Uh, but it invokes different parts of of mental processing to do that, and so the research really has to be aligned around those different processes that are being activated in order to arrive at that discrete decision. Um, so I, I, I like your uh, description that there really isn't uh, explicit research, there really isn't implicit research, it's just research into this phenomenon of, of uh, you know, human decision making uh, and, and in a marketing context, consumer decisions. Uh, it uh, kind of harkens back to something Aaron uh, has said quite often that he would like to actually dispose of the term neuromarketing because all marketing is neuro in the end. Yeah. Uh, so okay. I, that, that being so, can I ask a supplementary? Why is it so important to you spend a lot of time talking about true implicit? Mm -hmm. Why? Why do you spend so much time talking about that? Well, again, in order to be implicit, in order to be capturing accurately, capturing and quantifying the emotional side of decision making, there are some pretty strict criteria around how the experiment has to be. And the biggest um, factor in that is that it has to be uncontrollable. So if you look at fast explicit, where you're, you're presented with a brand, let's say, and you're sorting it into, you know, uh, it's trendy or 
of stale. Um, those judgments, even with a response latency technique, those judgments are still ultimately controllable. Um, you can decide that you're gonna swipe down or you're gonna sort into one category, even if it's not the way you feel. Um, and this is what we, we call the core of this problem is the can't say, won't say phenomenon, uh, where people uh, will represent their choices explicitly in a very different way than they actually feel. It's one of the reasons that polling data has become so inaccurate or so unreliable. And so, unless you have a true implicit measurement technique where you're using uh, either um, biometric data or implicit association type data, where you're actually tapping into consumer non-conscious and you're presenting them, in the case of implicit association techniques, with a visual stimulus, a prime, if you will, that uh, they can't control their reaction to. You can't control your reaction to an image, uh, at least your, your non-conscious reaction. It's irrepressible, it's automatic, it's activating your system when thinking. And so that's why we really believe that uh, non-conscious measurement techniques, and in, in our case, implicit association testing, is the most reliable, scalable, cross-cultural and cross-language uh, research technique. Uh, that gets at that non-conscious side of things. Okay, so we had a question in the middle, in the back, and this will be our last question. Hi, Pippa Bailey from Ipsos Mori. I just had a question about, um, I've seen the same thing, that irrespective of what sort of explicit choice-based techniques you use, you get the same results, and implicit does give you something different, but I've always found the data to be with different implicit techniques quite noisy. What sort of implicit technique are you using? We use a, a visual priming technique where uh, the respondent is essentially confronted with a 500 millisecond image. Uh, the image can be a brand, uh, it can be video, uh, if you will. Uh, it can be uh, uh, words. Uh, ideally, it's some sort of iconographic image. Um, those are, tend to be the most powerful at, at triggering, activating, System one responses. So and so after got something the, popping up and then they're doing a sorting task. Exactly. So after they're exposed to the visual prime, they then have to switch to system two cognition where they're actually sorting a word or, or a phrase into a category. And that response latency uh, actually is very predictive or gives us quite a bit of insight uh, to be able to model the emotional reaction to that prime. It's interesting that um, being at an innovation forum, one of the innovations methodologically that we're pursuing now is the opportunity to actually gather data on touchscreen devices, whether it's a tablet or a mobile phone, um, that is more than just response latency. We're actually now able to capture, on certain types of touch devices, we're able to catch the duration of the swipe. Uh, so if it's a very short swipe versus a very long swipe, we're also able to capture the, the pressure, uh, the amount of pressure that's being placed on the screen. Uh, and so when you get you know, more pressure, uh, then you're, you're certainly uh, causing a more intense reaction uh, to the visual prime. And so incorporating that kind of data uh, using these touch sensitive devices and the, the, the stream of data that those throw off is one of the key innovate, methodological innovations for us. Over 35% of our data is now collected on mobile devices, whether it's a tablet or a mobile phone. Uh, and so when you start to talk about researching in, in parts of the world where there isn't reliable broadband, fixed broadband connection, uh, having something that works just as effectively, if not more effectively, on a mobile device becomes crucial to, to doing data collection all around the world. Joe, thank you very thank much. You. We've got time for a break, and then we'll, uh, we've got 20 minutes of break, and then we'll start the sessions again. Joe, thanks.